We are here on the second Sunday of Easter, reflecting one last time on the way home. And how do we get to the way home? We've gone all along that line until we reached the point last week where at the resurrection we reflected on the women in Mark who encountered the young man in the tomb saying that Jesus had rose from the grave and they needed to go to the disciples where they had the reaction of, come again? where they were actually full of fear, and and Mark's actual original ending ends with them full of fear. And while we know that they must have gone on and told the disciples because of what would come of the church in the days to follow, that the book ends there as if to leave the readers or the hearers of the gospel with a question. How will you respond to the good news that Jesus is resurrected? And how will you respond when you haven't even seen it today. Well, we, we find a very similar scenario with the disciples in John. We read as they're huddled together in an upper room with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leadership, fear that they may be arrested and tried, convicted and crucified in the same way that Jesus had been. They're hiding out in fear. We, can, we know at this point they've started to hear the news that Jesus has rose from the grave, that Jesus is resurrected, that death could not overcome the love of God at work in this world. But yet they're hiding away until Jesus comes to them and says, peace be with you, and shows himself to him, including the, the marks in his hands and in his side. But as the story goes on, we learn that there was one disciple, one of the high-profile disciples in the Gospels that wasn't there with them, who didn't get to have that experience the first time around. And so when the disciples go and seek to explain to Thomas that we have seen Jesus, he has resurrected, Thomas proclaims, I will not believe unless I see it for myself. I will not believe it unless I can touch his hands and put my hand in his side. That's the only way I'll believe. Now, it's this reaction of Thomas not believing the account of his friends and those that had followed Jesus most closely with him that has led us to label Thomas as the doubting Thomas. You know, and it causes us to question Thomas from the beginning and so thankful that Jesus delivered him out of his great doubt. But I wonder if there's not more going on with this story because the reality is Thomas is simply asking for the same experience that the disciple, the other disciples around him had had. In fact, if we read closely enough in the story, we find that even though those disciples who had gone to Thomas and said, you got to hear this great news, Jesus has resurrected, death is overcome, evil is overcome, we are saved. Even though they went and proclaimed this good news to him, they're still locked away in that upper room for fear of the Jewish leadership and fear that they might be arrested, tried, convicted, and crucified. So Thomas is there with them, having not seen what they've seen, but their behavior, even though they have seen and even though Jesus breathes the Holy Spirit upon them, Thomas is simply in the same place they are. They have yet to lead with the good news out beyond the locked doors. But yet when Jesus comes, appears to them again, and says to them, including Thomas, peace be with you. And he approaches Thomas and he says, look at my hands, put your hand in my side. We know Thomas responds at that moment The first time in the book of John, as has been anticipated throughout from the prologue in which we know that Jesus was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, that that anticipated proclamation comes forth from Thomas' lips, my Lord and my God. In that moment, Thomas recognizes Jesus for who he fully and finally is, the Lord and God of all creation at work in this world to first bring it into existence out of God's love, the triune God's love that, want, that wished, to share, wished to be shared with the creation that would come to be. But now here is Jesus who has come into this world as cre- re- creator, redeemer, and savior, sustainer, 
to renew the creation, to save creation from everything that's come upon it because of the rebellion of humanity. And here Thomas proclaims that as a reality, my Lord and my God. And it's at that moment, followed by continued teaching by Jesus, that now we will find the disciples beyond the locked doors. So maybe more instead of looking at Thomas as the doubting Thomas who wasn't as faithful as the other disciples up until this moment, maybe we need to see Thomas as a kind of leader among the disciples, the one who would proclaim the risen Jesus whom he encountered the way the other disciples did and would proclaim him as my Lord and my God. And then perhaps was part of the reason that the early church advanced beyond the locked doors and the fear that gripped their heart, despite the fact that they knew that Christ had risen from the grave. So maybe we should actually, in a way, want to be like Thomas. Maybe we want to have such an encounter with Christ, even though we won't have that literal encounter with the resurrected Christ like the disciples and Thomas and, and the women who, were, who took the word to the disciples had. We won't have that experience. But we will have the experience of the Spirit at work among us, the Spirit touching our hearts, the Spirit opening in our eyes to God's work in this world. And that experience will be one of resurrection. That experience will be one of encountering the resurrected Christ in a different way than the disciples. But we can be like Thomas. We can cast aside our fear and we can proclaim that Jesus is my Lord and my God. And we can go out beyond the locked doors to share the good news with all the world while embracing the teachings of Christ as the disciples did following Thomas's proclamation. So maybe we actually want to be a little bit like Thomas. Even though we can't, we don't have the option of sitting around and saying, I will not believe unless I can see his hands and put my hand in his side. Because we know that we are blessed for believing though we haven't seen. And the story of of the disciples and Thomas, it brings us to an encounter with two promises that Jesus makes in the Gospel of John being fulfilled. The first is Jesus' proclamation, Jesus' assurance to them, peace be with you. This goes back to John 14, 27, where he is explaining to the disciples that peace I leave with you. You will have peace if you are in me. Now, they go through everything that takes place in the passion of the Christ, the scattering of the disciples, wondering what's going to be next, hiding out in that upper room, and here that promise is fulfilled. Jesus is coming to them to assure them and saying, peace be with you. While at the same time, breathing the Holy Spirit into them and saying, as the Father sent me, now I send you. So we can embrace the peace of God with us. Despite the struggles, despite the sorrows of this world, despite the resistance we may face when we go forth and proclaim the good news that Jesus resurrected from the grave and is Lord and God, knowing that God is by our side and knowing that even though the Lord and God that we worship is the crucified one and did die, that death has been overcome through the resurrection. And know that any suffering that any Christians anywhere go through, be it in Egypt or Pakistan or, or anywhere in this world where they come under persecution, whether we would one day come under persecution for our faith, we know that we can continue to proclaim the resurrection and the fact that Jesus is Lord and God, knowing that those threats of death have been overcome in the resurrection and that the, God's love cannot be stopped by any such threat or temporary reality of death. Now, the second promise is the coming of the Holy Spirit. Jesus, in, verse, in chapter 14 and 15 of John, tells the disciples... I will send the Spirit, the Advocate, the Comforter, the Teacher. And the Spirit will be with you, even though I no longer will be. It is the Spirit that brings us in touch with our Lord and our God. 
in Jesus Christ and God the Father in heaven, in the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That spirit is where we find the presence of God today, where we can have faith, though we do not see. What incredible blessing it is to have the spirit breathed upon us in baptism and in discipleship so that we can see our lives transformed even though we don't have Jesus to hold on to and to ask its direct questions to. Knowing that by study of his word, through prayer, through, through communal accountability, through having the faith that's given to us by the Spirit to step out and, ta- and risk-taking mission, we can encounter the Spirit and be given a new and growing faith each and every day of our lives. And yet these two things, peace I leave with you and the coming of the Holy Spirit, point us to the overarching narrative of John in Scripture as it is anyway. Remember, as we encounter the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is present in creation. If we go back to Genesis 1, we see, we see God speaking to the chaos, to the depths, and calling creation into existence, bringing order out of that chaos. And it is in Genesis that we're told the wind of God or the Spirit of God was, pa- was passing back and forth across the water. So the Spirit has an active role in creation. John 1 makes that same connection with creation, but puts Jesus in that same position. Because Jesus, as I mentioned before, was the Word, the Word with God and was God. And that nothing that was created would have been created without the Word. So we have Jesus who is also there in creation. So Genesis 1 and John 1 come together to point to us that a new creation is taking shape by Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And if we think, if we read through Genesis, we see that while there was a beautiful creation that God had blessed and that had God had given stewardship over to humanity, that humanity rebelled, that humanity entered into sin. And that that began with the fratricide of Cain against Abel that spread into the point that the violence was so, so filled the earth. As we read in Genesis 9, the violence so filled the earth that God grieved ever, having ever created humans. And we know as the story goes in Genesis, the decision that God made that the only way to save humanity and to save creation was to save humanity from itself through the flood, but by sparing Noah's family. In that time, it seemed perhaps that that was the way to break the cycle. But here we see that Jesus comes into the world bringing peace, not only this inner sense of peace that we can have assurance in God every day of our lives, but it's a call to peaceful living. It's a call that as that s- the spirit of new creation enters into our lives, we can lay down our contention with one another. We can lay down the violence of the world. We can lay down our hunger for vengeance. And we can take up the way of peace revealed by the crucified, resurrected Christ. And we know as this recreation continues... As we resist the call that the world places on us for violence, that that we can be in the Spirit, and that Jesus is the light of the world, who sends the Spirit to us so that we can continue by proclamation and by life and by deeds, reveal the light of the world to the world in an ongoing fashion. That we can be the people of peace, the people that take up the cause of those in anguish, the cause of those who are suffering, the cause of the widow, the orphan, the immigrant, the cause of those who are oppressed in this world. Not seeking vengeance, but in the peace of Christ that is given us when we encounter the resurrected Jesus, our God and our Lord. And so here is our call today. Today is to, the call today is to embrace the resurrection in such a way that it overcomes our fear. Because we live in a time, we live in a world that is driven by fear. Whether they're political opponents, whether they're national opponents, military opponents, terror opponents, whatever they may be, we are driven by fear of the other. That if we don't take up for ourselves 
then we will be eliminated from the face of the earth. Or that if we don't stand up for what we believe is true, and if we don't force that on all others, then our society as we know it will absolutely collapse. It's a fear-driven way of life that God is calling us to say, answer with love. My love, my resurrection, my crucifixion, everything I've done on on the behalf of this creation, on behalf of humanity, for the sins of this world, is so that the cycles of fear and oppression and violence will be overcome by my grace through the work of the Holy Spirit in this world. So lay aside fear and take the risk of love. The love of God, the love of neighbor, that love of neighbor that extends even to the love of enemies. And understanding that we don't survive by the self-preservation that we take hold of so often in our lives, but we will survive and thrive by the grace that comes to us through the resurrection of the martyred God and Lord of this world, Jesus Christ. In the name of the Son, or in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. Amen.